Hello there, this is intended as a short overview of the game Byzantium Reborn. It uh, was the edition I have, I don't know if there's a, another that was released under the Counter-Strike label, a mini-game by um, the Fairy Dragon Company. So you might have seen my Brian Train game in the Tin Box edition by then before. Um, Brian Train game, uh, this game uh, is by... R. Ben Madison, and it, he acknowledges the debt to Brian Train because he uses the same sort of basic chassis um, uh, as Ariba Espana, which Brian Train has also used for some other games. I also, uh, over there, which I'm going to do, have a go at next, is um, uh, Ben Madison's uh, CSA, which is the American Civil War in the same mini sized map as this, which also looks like it has the same basic chassis. But um, we'll see what other changes there are. <clears throat> so, um, Byzantium Reborn comes with uh, this nifty little booklet, like um, all the ones that, that, that I, by which I mean three that I have from Fiery Dragon. They're something like 28 pages long and they're exceedingly good in that the layout is nice. You've got um, case numbering. But, and you've got clear um, s separation of traces, clear heading, and then you've got you know clear sections. Um, the uh, proofreading and editing is excellent. Very little errata, one or two sort of you know like odd uh, word artifacts, but um, very little errata also in the sense of rules inclusion. Now I take that partly. Um, Ben Train, uh, Brian, sorry, <laughs> Brian Train's fault for Ariba Spani. I think he's very good at rules writing. Um, but this one is is similar. Um, I don't know if it's the case with Ariba Spani, but it did come up in this that there's there were some questions that I had left that are not addressed in the rules, which are things to do with like um, from Brian Train's system, you, you have units which enter regions here. They're called vilets, um, which I guess is the Turkish name for a, a kind of um governmental region um, and you can have a number of battle groups in there and then they can come and fight different battle groups so my question was um, more to do with things like um, multiple battle groups and retreats and things like that along that line I can't remember exactly what my questions were but it wasn't a biggie um, uh, that was the only question that I had so um, what do you get with a game? So you get this mini map, you can see the size, you get counters which are decent thickness. They um, have the uh, fluffy th bits on those bits, so if that bothers you, that's a bother. But it doesn't bother me, I normally clip my counters. Um, no need to in this. You can see this is the end of the game, it's a Turkish victory. You have the Greeks here, they, they were basically pushed back and Turkey ended with them. Um, uh, they took Smyrna, Constantinople, Angora, and Adana down here from the French, and that uh, uh, those four places garnered them on the um, twelfth out of fifteen turns uh, a sudden death victory. Uh, they in fact would have won on that turn anyway by causing enough political support level loss um, due to destroyed um, corps and. Uh, divisions and um, ass and uh, assets like artillery assets essentially to the enemy to bring their political support level down to zero to take them out of the game that way as well and those are the two ways you win the game the Greeks also also win if they stay in the they're still in the game at the end of the 15th turn I thought that was going to happen because they they were very strong here but um attack can be very powerful in this game you might take a lot of losses but you can deal a lot of damage especially if both sides have a have a lot of combat factors in a battle and uh, the turks were able to um mass a lot of force towards the end mainly because of their adjustment on the great powers track so um they were getting international um, intervention from italy and russia which gave them 2d6 Political support points a turn. Uh, no, sorry, two uh, d six. Um, each so that's four d six equipment points, which meant they could buy a lot of assets. That's uh, artillery or planes, 
and also um, building forces. You can see there's no unbuilt forces at the end. All, all of the um, Turkish forces are on the map. They were maxed out. The Greeks were too, but they have less. And um, although they, they did have a French support, kind of like not supporting as such as the French, which were also t um, interfering with the Turks and the Armenians down here, which the Turks had managed to knock out. Um, but anyway, I'm, I don't want to sort of go into a session report, it's more overview of the game, but that's just to give you an idea of play and so you can, some context for what you're looking at now, the end of game state. So this is the Turkish peninsula, Constantinople up there. Um, let's have a quick zoom in to see what you get. Okay, so... Um, you have your villette. Uh, these indicate rail strategic transport possible. Then every villette has a, a capital city and um, it's in somebody's control or at the start of the game uncontrolled or possibly contested by um, units from different size being in it. Um, then you also have, and now these, these red lines, um, this is a uh, an economic... Um, city, so that will that gains you great advantages in sense of political support and um, equipment points. But normally, um, that will be in a region. You can either be on the city or anywhere in the region. You could have any number of battle groups. A battle group is essentially a stack. Um, f normally four units. The Greeks have gone down to three because of a political event. Um, so normally you can see that. So I underlined with red just to indicate that that is an economic city so I could easily read it when counting up. Similarly, that black line indicates that's one of the sudden death cities. Then um, you have desert areas, impassable area here, and these lakes also block movement. Um, then, uh, so desert, clear, rough, and mountainous terrain. And on the terrain effects chart, the Turks generally are fine attacking except mountains off, most of the time set them at a disadvantage. The Greeks were at a disadvantage in rough mountain, desert on attack and defence. And also um, either side will gain a, a, an advantage in combat for being in a city. So you, and uh, also, um, for, I can't remember if the trench does, I, I might have missed a rule there. Um, so that's a quick look at that because I want to show you some of the other things you get. So this is called the Omnibus Markers Track and on it you're marking equipment points, political support level. Um, so equipment points is for buying replacements, um, reinforcements and these um, artillery and air assets. Um, it also has a marker for air power. Because a nifty little thing, because this is um, uh, post First World War, so immediately post, uh, air power is a bit sort of rough and ready. So each turn you roll 2d6, sorry about the glare. Um, and uh, that's the worth of combat factors which air power can bring in. So I did actually have, you know, one turn air power is only worth two combat factors. Perhaps there was terrible weather in the region or, you know, people had disasters occurring next turn it was like eight or nine points so that's a nice and the good thing is is that it works for both sides and it's also kind of like a bit of a balancer depending on the role if one side has a lot more than the other so then you have the air unit displays the holding boxes for ready and used um each turn is like between a month and three months and uh, this is the turn record track. You have winter turns and autumn turns. In winter, there's no movement, no fighting. In autumn, there's uh, you can fight. Um, there's no movement, um, uh, but there is strategic movement, and uh, y y you can fight if you're already, you know, um, contesting a villiet. Um, there's some other things marked on the turn track, like there. Um, you have optional rules, uh, so the um, Turk can get in some very handy um, cavalry divisions. They're great because they add an optional role of plus or minus on in the battle. I'll get into that later. Um, then you can also have role for 
uh, the Greek election, which can have an effect, impact on pay, play. And then the last year of the game, so it's essentially three years of combat. The last year, each turn after winter, you can roll for catastrophe, which is a Greek catastrophe. And again, the um, that uh, would have been in effect if the Greeks hadn't been knocked out by the Turks in the game that I just played. Um, uh, so, yeah, so this also, so the holding box also contains a dead pile and you have these, um, these units, uh, uh, Turkish units conducting the Armenian war. So, um, not an option rule, but it's an option for either, um, player to, um, bring that war to a conclusion and units will be, uh, some sort of modifications, but units will be lost and the Turks can bring on what is left out of that, but at cost in political movement. So the Great Powers track starts with um, Italy supporting, but not intervening. So they only do 1d6 EP and less political support. Uh, Russia neutral, France and uh, USA and Great Britain neutral. But um, France, USA and Great Britain attending to, to go pro-Greek and um, Russia and Italy attending to go pro-Turkish, as Italy already is. Um, and uh, I coloured these in just to distinguish them at a glance, which was support, which was intervention, and which was neutral. In my game, I've played this, I think it's the third, maybe even the fourth game I've played. Um, but this one I just played, um, the USA went out of the running after... A political event which happens you have two random events phases each turn so you can have 30 potentially random events often many random events they only occur once so if you roll them again they don't occur comes so you've got two pages of random events what was it um yes that was it so i rolled usa senate votes on versailles treaty they reject it they become isolationist and um USA is basically out of the game, won't be given any foreign aid. And um, so we, we ended the game like this with Russia and Italy on full on secure support for Turkey and um, France and Britain kind of wavering because um, as Greece was taking a battering, it, it, it sort of freed up some political support ability of the, the Turks were basically gaining more political support so they were able to start dragging so you have a tug of war along these political support tracks if you wish but you have to be careful because you lose political support on losing uh, units above regiment level regiments just one combat factor divisions four corps five which are, and they have multi-step um and so you lose political support for um losing bigger combat units and also for having regions taken from you and also then if you are risking you can um to gain modifiers on advantage on this track you you will be rolling d6 for the mod so you're not exactly sure how much that uh, modification is going to cost you so y you have to be careful because if your political support level goes to zero you lose the game so for example greece maybe should have held off trying to uh, clamoring for aid because they, they did spend 3d6 political support to try and get France back into um, intervention which obviously would have given them more equipment points which they obviously need because they were getting battered but they so they, they tried to bring them back I think they were unlucky at that point so it, those are wasted but either way their political support level had gone down low and then they lost enough units in uh, two and Villiers of combat in that um, last uh, April May turn that I played that their political support went down too low. So you can see you have that um tricky balancing game between um political support tug of war and then the um military thing. Um. So that's the sort of the game in, in a nutshell. Um, you have also. So this is political support adjustment summary. Um, you have recovery table units can get disrupted. Uh, you have equipment points cost. Um, then you have what's called his holiness table. So the game starts with the ecumenical patriarch and the caliph, who was, who was the old 
Ottoman Emperor in um, Constantinople. And it, they give a, a modicum, a tiny bit of support to each side every turn. So they're, they're on opposing sides, but Constantinople starts out a British controlled. Um, so the Brit has control markers in three regions, Constantinople being one of them at the start of the game. And if anyone encroaches upon that, it costs political support. Um, just for that turn, you can you know drag it back later. Um, but then, for example, then you roll on his holiness table, and it turned out that um, uh, the ecumenical patriarch was arrested and taken off out of the game. So the caliph stayed, the Turks took took it. So if the Greeks had taken Constantinople, it would have been the caliph who was in danger. Then you also have the brigands table, which can come on on on. A random event they didn't come in mind they're um, a small bunch of counters down there um, and then at the top there you have the Turkish outrage table so that at the end of every turn the Turks uh, depending on the number of villiers controlled by the Greeks they roll for a possible outrage which basically gives them a little bit of political or equipment uh, um, support from abroad um, Okay, so um, one thing I did do was, um, I think this was from Board Game Geek, I downloaded, it didn't come in the game, this sequence of play, which is very useful. And I'll just go through that with you. So you start first random events phase, um, sort out that random event. The uh, Turks can also try to mobilise women. Um, so that's a die roll, and that basically means you can sort of mobilise units even in um, Villiers controlled by the enemy. I believe that's correct. I didn't. I kind of was forgetting about that. I don't think I really needed it this game. Then you go to the political phase. In the first turn, this is the only phase you play. Um, both players attempt to influence foreign powers, spending political support. Then the Greeks can roll to activate a faction. There's three factions which start out on the board. I think there's five counters, and they're in black. And they're basically anti kemalist Like Kemal Pasha was the um, the Turkish uh, colonel or something to start with, who basically um, ran the war and became the leader of you know by popular support was asked to become the leader or he stepped into the role of the leader of the new. Turkey after this collapse of the Byzantine Empire and um, this uh, the Greek um, Italian and French and Armenian attempts and and also British sort of attempts at land grabs hence um, Byzantium reborn so the question being is it going to be reborn as mainly Greek you know will it be a small um, French an Italian with just a small Turkish bit, or will it be what is now the historical Turkey? And I think um, in my game, I, I, I don't know, I, actually I have been to Turkey and um, I went, visited, um, didn't know anything really about the history and that, but I visited the monument to, um, he's called Ataturk, which means father of the Turks, the father of the, the country as it is now. Kemal Pasha before that, and uh, it's a mighty impressive monument. And then reading a little bit about his history, uh, he's one of those chaps like Garibaldi or other kind of fellows who they're the man on the spot, and he just turned everything around. What could have been a disaster for what's now um, for the, the the remnants of the Ottoman Empire, he 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 sort of grabbed the straws and. I, it, I was really impressed by his story, like some other people in history like that. And uh, it, in fact, inspired me to paint a picture um, based on him when I came back, um, based on what I felt his kind of motivating spirit was. Very sort of powerful. But, and, and I also bought a biography um, of him, which I've, I've read most of it. A lot of it is, of course, about the fighting. And so one of those impressive figures of history, like Haley Selassie too, um, who really kind of seem to stand for their people and country, not for themselves. Unlike, um, you know, someone who rose because of the moment, unlike, I think, many leaders and or politicians who rise because they want to 
to become that. Um, anyway, um, so, so um, there's but there are those anti cumulus factions are left on the board. On the board, so some here, some here, and some here. And so the, the Greek can, can roll to activate them. Or if the Turk invades where they are, then they automatically activate against the Turk. Then you roll for the air value. That was that 2d6, that marker up there. And then the Caliph and the Patriarch, if they're in Constantinople, they give a one point political support each. Then you go to a start. Every turn starts with the Greek player phase. The um, except on turn two. So turn two... Um, you, so turn one is just a political phase and the random event. Then turn two is those two, and then, or maybe the first phase. You no, know, the first turn you don't actually have the random event, but anyway. Then the, the second turn, um, only the Turk gets their player turn, but you do have a strategic phase where there's some build up, and fr but th from then on, then the Greek player phase is first. So the player phase starts with the battle group step. That's essentially where. No matter how many um, battle groups, each separate stack, even if it's a single unit is a battle group in a villette, you can reorganize them. So, you know, put some in, in the city, some outside of uh, however you like. So you do that reorganization. Then you do strategic move, which is basically 1d6 minus 2. Of the Greeks can move by ports. And then another 1d6 minus 2 of the Turks or Greeks can move on those rails Um as far as you possibly can or want to. Then you have the normal movement step. Normally it's two villiettes maximum. You must stop in an enemy controlled or enemy occupied villiette. Then you go into combat. Then there's a possible counter attack and then there's recovery. Now combat is interesting because um, you don't have to fight. So you could share villiettes and that could be strategic in, in which to, uh, because at the end of the turn there's an interface and you can roll for contesting a region. If you... you player controls a region and on the contest they lose it they will lose some political support so you don't even have to um fight them uh, you could just sit in their territory to cause that to occur but otherwise um as many battle groups can fight um once as you like e each turn and an enemy battle group can be attacked by as many battle groups as you like so um but you can't have sort of multiple battle groups attacking in one attack um, but that works fine, and uh, if if say um, you've only got a unit uh, units in the city, the enemy goes and if they want to fight, you, they have to fight you in the city at a disadvantage, or so maybe disadvantage because of terrain. If on the other hand you've got a, at least one battle group, which could just be like I said, one unit, um, somewhere else in the villiette, they have to attack that first before they can attack you in the city. So a handy ploy is to have a number of sort of soak off units or groups so that your city is um, kept safer. The enemy doesn't have to destroy them, they just have to fight them. So, you know, if you have three and one in the city, the enemy has to send in four battle groups minimum. Before, um, so three to, con to deal with the other three before they can fight you in the city. Then the counterattack step is interesting. Like if units both sides are left in the same villiette, the enemy who, who had a battle group that wasn't attacked Mike is able to counterattack any unit that did attack that turn so that's a nice thing which keeps things going and then you go to the recovery step which is that um see I've got flipped units here I put these dots on the back just let me see at a glance that those ones are Greek those ones are Turk um they function at half power so I can't remember if it's round down or up um, but so that would be two points I think or three and um and I think they can't move, but uh, generally, yes. Yeah, so, and then you, that you roll for them to recovery. This we have a table, some modifiers. Um. Then so that's the first player turn. Then you have a second random event phase. Let's have another look at a possible random event. So, for example, Turkish Itahadist loot Greek businesses. So that's gain some equipment points, political support. Nicomedia intervention if Constantinople was British controlled. Uh, that was interesting. So Constantinople is British controlled. Nicomedia is caliphate controlled. Turkish controlled, contested or unoccupied. The British invade. And I had that. I had massive Turkish force here ready to move into Constantinople. 
that event was rolled, the Brits just move in and completely eradicated the Turkish force. So you can get big counter swings like that, but then, you know, you've got two random events phases each turn. On the other hand, oh look, the Russian Civil War, didn't have that. Revenge of the Apo... Apoptoi. I had that. The Hellenic army is purged of Venizelist, he was the uh, Prime Minister at the time, elements, who are replaced by ageing political hacks. Greek battle groups may no longer contain more than three units instead of the normal four. And you must immediately reorganise your battle groups to comply. So that happened. So uh, uh, again, if it, you roll it again, it, obviously it doesn't happen again. So the Greeks were set back by that, the Turks were set back by that, it balances out. Then we go to the strategic phase. So both players calculate how many equipment points they receive. Uh, it comes from domestic, so for the uh, Greeks that's 3d6, the Turks don't get that. Economic cities, so the economic cities are underlined in red, so you count them up and you halve that and that's the number of d6. The Greeks get, the Turks get all of them. So um, the Turks were doing well at the end because they'd managed to push the French out of the region and the French had control of four economic cities down there so that was 46 economics points per turn that that garnered for the, the Turks. Um, uh, then also foreign aid, yes, yeah, so like I said interventional support can give you greater or lesser um, and then also the Caliph and the Patriarch give one equipment point each. Um, then both players build, uh, build, rebuild and upgrade units using those equipment points, including you can bang on trenches um, within the restrictions of the rules. Now trenches are interesting because I did actually, the Turks did have a trench line here because um, they, they originally they start the game further forward. The Greeks were pushing strongly so they decided to entrench in the mountains. That worked effectively. The Greeks decided to um, consolidate and just hang on for the end of the war that was maybe their mistake because trenches don't stop you if you move into a villette the next turn you can move out so you can there's no zone of control as such you can just keep moving not you have to stop the turn when you enter in any occupied villette but you can move out after that so this trench line wouldn't have held um, the Greeks, if they'd intended to push, but they, unless they controlled a city in the Villiet, so had control of the Villiet, effectively, they, they would have problems with supply. Uh, so that's a consideration. And then when you've done that, then you go to which is a nifty thing, air um, asset points and artillery asset points are bought after bidding. Now that's an interesting thing, because actually on the equipment points cost chart, it says the asset points cost, cost 1d6 variable and that is in the brown train Ariba Spania system um, it's a 1d6 variable so you're never quite sure how much they're going to cost turn to turn but in this it goes one further and that was very interesting in that you bid so essentially the Turk starts and he says right um, okay here's the assets and you start with air I'll bid one the Greek says two the Turk says three the Greek says okay no higher so the Turk goes oh, okay so I have to buy at least one at three um, and then the Greek can buy as many as they like or as are left after that at three. And the Turk always starts at the end. It was very nice because what you're doing is the, the Greeks, I think, had a little bit of it. But you either. Yes, they did. You either the enemy's equipment points and see how many you have. And, and we were getting ridiculous amounts towards the end with, you know, 2d6 from two countries doing international support, intervention and so forth. And so um, at the beginning of the game, they were going for one, two, three points each. At the end, um, we had like the Greeks at one point, I think, brought it up to, it was 28, just to deny uh, one um, air power to the Turks um, because the uh, Greeks could afford it and they didn't want the Turks to gain any advantage. So you get a nice little bidding war in that um part as well uh, then you also place reinforcements any reinforcements and bring on your new builds um, then you go to the Turkish player phase exactly the same as the Greek player phase and then you end with the interphase both players determine control for all the villiets so you check who controls which and you roll for contestation so um, 
if they're contested, someone might win or it might remain uncontested, or you might send that's kind of contested from controlled. And then you make adjustments to political support depended on certain villiers, like um, ones that are within the Greek ethnicity. And then um, also uh, down the bottom, these green ones are Italian units. And you can see on the map you have Italian flags. So all the villiers with an Italian flag is kind of like Italian area of interest. If uh, uh, another, the Italians are, are NPCs, non-player uh, characters forces but if the Turk or the Greek gains one of these villiers then they will get political support for that presumably from countries separate from Italy the same goes for these French um, areas of interest and uh, so that's how you gain your political support and also for every villiers that you control you gain one point political support if you've just gain control you gain two points and if you lose control you lose 1d6 so it could cost you a lot maybe not so much you know again there's that dicey where is my political support i don't mean dicey as in really random i mean dicey as in risky um uh, then uh, the turkish player checks for turkish outrage i mentioned that before each player may choose to resolve the war in armenia I mentioned that before, that was that stack there. And then finally, return uh, asset points back to the ready box. And that's the end of a turn. And uh, like I said, there's 15 and the winter and spring, uh, no or, or much less movement and not even any fighting in winter. So, um, and there being three winter turns, two autumn, um, so and in the, in fact in my game in the middle year in nineteen twenty one there was just a lot of build up and not much movement, uh, but there was a lot of political fighting going on, and uh, of course the random events are still occurring. So that it's, it's not so great. It doesn't sound so great as random events, but to call them you know outside political influences coming in because that's what all of the random events are. That someone died, a king dies from a monkey bite. Treaty repudiation of an agreement etc so these are all basically london diplomatic conference cans Dipl so apart from the looting they're all really sacro what is it called sacro egoismo nationalist gain in italian cabinet shuffle so the italians will move um by a random event and in fact they actually ceded control of this villiet sorry about the glare so the Turks at a certain point by around events. So all these outside political things are going on. Gives you a bit of a feel of, you know, a, of war within a political arena. Because as a player, really, you are Kemal Pasha or the um, headquarters command, a bit anonymous of the Greeks. There's a, there's a tiny bit of a, a historical introduction in the... Um, uh, in, at the beginning of the game, uh, there's an in, there's an index, but which is really a contents list, but not an index as such. So the great idea, um, and there's also um, uh, bibliography at the back. There's lots of um, fifty section fifteen, which is all these last pages are optional rules. I used all of them, but not all of them. Were you, came in. So mobilising women, the, the Caliph and the Ecumenical Patriot, the brigands, refugees, that's something you can do. You can sort of terrorise a villette which then sends refugees and then the enemy has to use troops to look after the refugees but you lose political support. Um, Treaty of Severus, now that was an event that I didn't come up. Trenches I used, railways I used. Catastrophe are used and commanders and cavalry are used, so there's you know a lot going for it. Um, it's a small box just to show you the size. Fits very neatly on your shelf. And what I would say is that in comparison to Ariba Spania, which I think is I'm able to compare, having played the both and then being. Like I said, one system based on the other. This one has um, even more legit. Rebus Spania is great as a portrayal of the 
Spanish Civil War. This one's it got even more loaded on it to the to the extent playing solo because you have to look after both sides. I was forgetting things like I've forgotten about um um mobilizing women and I've forgotten about refugees. Every now and then you know I'd sit in the book as I was checking something else and then I'd forget again because there's so much um historical flavour in a small packet here. Which is a good thing, but you know that's just one thing to remember. Um I, I was looking in the book more than I was in Ariba Spania because there's more little extras to check. Um but it's funny, I don't think the book's any the rule book's any bigger. So this has been quite long enough, much longer than I had intended, but as long as I think this game required to go over it. Just one thing I'd like to mention, which I'm, I've, I've already recorded and I'll post after this a playthrough of a turn of this game. There's one thing which I forgot, which is, so you know, like illustrative of the um, extra flavour. So um, battle groups on defence can retreat and minimise their losses. I didn't go into the combat system, which I must do. And, uh, but what I didn't, something I didn't mention from... Yeah, that's yeah. So battle groups can retreat to minimize losses. Also, the Turks have a special ability to withdraw control um, from regions rather than losing it. So they can sort of retreat before the enemy, who who will then gain control. But the Turks don't lose the one d six political support for moving out. Um, just to mention the the combat, it's because it's I don't know if it's copyrighted, but especially mentioned, it's by. Weston J. Ernie and uh, oh, look here, political system Barber Madison based on Brian Train's Ariba Spania. Um, there's a bit more than just the political system is based on Ariba Spania, but um, I don't know, maybe Ariba Spania is also based on the games for the sort of the area movement, so forth. But anyway, Weston Ernie's combat system is this is that. Um, you find a place where you're fighting. So here we've got Greeks, and and let's just say for the sake of argument, so the Greeks are here. With sorry, I can't zoom in anymore, and the Turks are here. So let's hold it by hand. Okay, so the Greeks have got 24 combat factors versus um, the Turkish 7 combat factors. And what you do is you choose how many d6 you want to roll. Look at all the d6. It's not a buckets of dice system because often there's only rolling sometimes one. Like if you've got, you know, one regiment of one combat factor in a region, you can only roll one dice um, because uh, he's only got one combat factor. I mean, you could roll more, but it doesn't make sense because... Uh, uh, but there was one battle where I did roll all of these for one side. But basically what you do is you, you choose how many dice you want to roll. Then you roll, and that is the number of hits that you cause, unless the roll is more than your number of combat factors. So if the Turk had chosen three dice, they would then have got um, 11, uh, which is well within their 24. But um, if... The Turks had chosen three dice, that would have been over seven, they would have scored no hits. So the Turks would have been a lot more sensible, say roll two, maybe even one, depending on how conservative they're going to be. So three, so they would have got seven, which was fine. Seven and they have seven, so they would have caused seven hits, and say the um, Greeks would have caused 11 hits. Then, um, so get disrupted so that's four combat factors takes four hits it becomes disrupted another four hits it's gone so that's eight nine ten so eleven the Turks would end up like that and then the Greeks would have okay that's four then we need to spend another three these are worth one each though they're worth plus six in the combat factor they're only one for losses um, so we're going to have to flip another one of those or, or lose that one and uh, they remember if you lose a division not a regiment but if you lose a division or a core which have five um, then you're going to get some political support loss just to mention the cause um, I'll just show you with a 
This is, happens to be a French counter. Um, the core is flipped. Okay, so that's five. Disrupted, taken off, that's ten. But then you bring on the remnant. And I, I came up only once for me, but um, I didn't bother checks. So it wasn't important. I can't remember if the remnant can flip as well. I'm sure it must be able to disrupt. So that would be another four points worth of combat factors lost. And that's how the combat works. Like I said, the attacker, I mean, the defender can also choose to retreat. So if as a defender you do retreat out of the area, then say the Turks retreated out of that, then um, because the um, Greeks had rolled three dice, then they can take three combat factors off Turks can take three off their losses, so they would have lost, what, eight in that example. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is how combat works. And it's great because you have this kind of like, um, you know, how far are you going to push it um, or how conservative are you going to be? But it hasn't really caught on. So it is great and it works really well in this. It hasn't really caught on because... At the end of the day, you're kind of wondering a little bit about what you're modelling, because what could happen is that you have a, a massive stack with tons of combat factors, say. You know, like I've got some there, like 5, 5, 4, 4, so that's um, 10, that's 18. Then then potentially I could have, that's a stack of 4, I could have 4 um, artillery assets, which is another 24, so where are we? We're on 38. 42 and then I could have potentially um four air assets and say that, that most often there'll be six seven eight but they could be 12 or two so imagine that another maybe 24 even 48 got massive so you could roll a massive amount of dice you only need to roll one over and you cause no hits at all and your opponent might have a tiny force and be able to give you a battering but then you know maybe that illustrates that uh, a disaster outside your control and a complete flummox because you know you can calculate how you will not um roll over but the point is is if you want to push and try and cause more losses and what it finds it does mean is that the attacker has to be conservative because they don't want to roll over and the defender if they're quite weak and they think i'm going to get wiped out they will push their luck and try to cause as many losses as they can that might end up in causing none so it's a it's a nice system but it's a little bit odd because say you know I, I do I am a mass I have a massive force and I roll and I and I just roll over, then my question is what kind of does that um illustrate historically? I've caused absolutely no damage to my foe at all, and that I for example might be completely wiped out. Um, but I guess uh, um complete swings like that can happen in history, especially if you're a blundering general who tries to do too much too soon or something um and it is mitigated by um each side has one leader counter the uh, headquarters command and kemal counter and so that can be in any one combat and um that allows you to roll an extra d6 after seeing the results and either adding or subtracting that so that can you know, bring you within safety and also so do the cavalry units now the greeks had three is it four cavalry units the um, uh, sorry, the Turks have I think, four cavalry units, the Greeks none. So, I really must finish here. That is it for Byzantium. The boar.